Praise God. If I must say before I begin this sermon, what a blessing it is to have experienced this, to prepare a message for the body, and to just grow a greater and deeper love for the Word and the Psalms. And in the same way, a greater reverence for the pulpit and our elders who every Lord's Day prepare a message for the body. So as we go through this summer in the Psalms, I encourage our fellow brothers who are going to step up to just press in and boldly proclaim how mighty our God is. In the words of John Knox, uh, I've never feared the devil. However, every time I approach the pulpit, I do with fear and trembling. So have some mercy on me if I do with some fear and trembling. Praise God for that. So we're going to go over our congregational reading. Um, Psalms 1 through 4 and 11 through 15. I'm going to add in the extra verse 15 because I think it's quite beautiful. How blessed is it that we're given another Lord's Day in the body. Church, you're going to hear me say that word blessed quite a bit today. When we speak of the blessedness, we are speaking about our fortunate, happy, and spiritual state of well-being. We are the blessed ones. We are loved, forgiven, adopted, and we receive every good gift from our Heavenly Father. So I will ask again how blessed it is to have an active God, not only in the midst of this church body, but also in the broader church throughout the world. Rejoice, for our God is sovereign, victorious, and mighty to save. And in Him, we are truly blessed. We see in the beginning of the psalm in verse 1, it is good to give thanks to the Lord. We, to sing praise to your name, O Most High. This psalm is a reflection of praise for the Sabbath. How do we know this? As Pastor Mike mentioned last week, there are pretext titles for the psalms. These texts are part of the Holy Scriptures. The section of this psalm falls into book four of five books within the psalms. Robert Godfrey titled these sections 90 through 106, as the king's comfort in God's faithfulness. Thus, the psalmist displays the wisdom of giving gratitude to the sovereign God. It is wisdom because there is nothing more wise than giving praise and thanks to God who created us and gave us all that we are and have. Just as today, we are going to witness a beautiful ceremony of another saint entering the Lamb's Book of Life. So rejoice, how blessed is that. By his word, all creation was spoken into existence. By his decree, the nation of Israel was set apart. By his work alone, the promise of Abraham was fulfilled. As we see in Psalms 107.1, For he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. From the heart, we ought to thank Him for His goodness, which grants us the very purpose of our lives. Throughout the Psalms, a common theme is quite present. This theme is the faithfulness of our sovereign triune God. In His unchanging and enduring love, He comforts His people. When pondering upon the unchanging, enduring love of God, I began to reflect on how our Savior identified Himself in John 8, 5, 8. Jesus said to the Jews, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I find a deeper meaning in focusing on the Greek word that is used in this text. The very two simple words at the end of Christ's quote, Ego, I me, or I am, is the same ego, I me, who spoke through the burning bush to Moses. How blessed is the unchanging God from Genesis to Revelation. His nature 
essence, and perfection never changes. This attribute of our sovereign triune God gives us hope, for He is good. His love endures forever. He never changes. The same God who gave the promise to Abraham about his seed is the same God David experienced and rejoiced in the Psalms. He is the same God who now also is the fulfillment of all those promises who entered his creation, the fully God, fully man, who did not seek equality with God, a thing to be grasped. As it says in Philippians 2, who emptied himself, taking on human form to the point of death, now is exalted high and given the name above all names. And what is that name? Yes. That name is Jesus Christ, Lord over all. Who now has sent us the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, who works in and through us to testify about His greatness and works. This is incredible and worthy of praise. It ought to cause us to want to praise our great God. How can we do anything other than rejoice? Praise and proclaim His sovereign good works, both in the body and throughout His creation. God decreed that His name will be glorified. Church, praise the Lord for that. As we continue to verse 2, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. This psalm reminds us of God's eternal love through all seasons of life. By His decree, the sun rises to His glory, and by night the moon shines as a reflection of His faithfulness to us through darkness. Beloved, it is a good thing to remind ourselves of the praise and worship God is owed at all times of the day and even in every season of life. As we can see in Psalms 19, the psalmist tells us that even creation itself is joined to the hymn of praise to God. He says that the heavens are declaring the glory of God day and night. By the order of the galaxies in which the planets are held precisely, the sun rises and lowers and the moon gleams in the night. A beautiful spectacle and reminder to us that the darkness will never overtake the light. The trees move freely by the providence of his breath in the wind. That very same breath of life that flows in our lungs and is carried through our veins. Those who know the Lord should proclaim and sing of his mercy and grace at all times. All times of the day and in every season of life. Yet, how quickly we forget in our busy lives that our Savior is on the throne as the firstborn of all creation. He is before all things as the head of the body that is the church. He gave us life when we were dead. He gave us a relationship when we were children of wrath. He gave us mercy when we deserved His wrath. To be in the hands of an angry God is terrifying. Yet by the grace of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are saved. We are more than just saved. We are justified through faith. By His works alone, Christ's righteousness is imputed onto us. We should give praise through the day and night. This means that every part of our lives is meant to be lived in the praise of God. This means during work and out of work. Every moment ought to truly be quorum Deo, which means before the face of God. Our whole life is lived in the presence of God. John Calvin, in a commentary on Psalms 92, states this when he says, The psalmist then would teach us that the right observance of the Sabbath day does not consist in idleness, as some absurdly imagine, but in the celebration of the divine name. He goes on to say, 
For nothing is more encouraging than to know that our labor is not in vain, in which we engage in is met with divine abrogation, which most simply means God smiles upon us, upon our work when it is done out of a heart of praise for him. We can do nothing good. We can, we can do good things with a bad heart and ruin the very good works we have done. Or we can do all things as unto the Lord and Coram Deo, knowing we are in his presence as his children, seeking to please him, and to fight indeed, he is pleased. So, whether we work in the public square, or spend ourselves raising the next generation in the way of the Lord, building our families and our homes, we do work with joyfulness, full of praise and gladness, knowing we do not serve human masters, but a heavenly master, knowing that we receive from the Lord an inheritance of eternal life. In this life, we have troubles and suffering, but all of that eventually ceases. But did you know that we will never cease? To praise God, even in eternity, our praises will never cease. St. Augustine talks about giving God continual praise in eternity when he states, Toil and welling shall cease, prayers diminish, but the hymns of praise will continue. There shall be the dwelling place of the blessed. Jesus will be present from whom we sigh. We shall be like him and see him as he is. We continue the verse 3 to the music, the lute, the harp, and the melody of the lyre. As I said in the beginning, this psalm is a reflection of the Sabbath. How appropriate is it then that we are here pondering this psalm together on this blessed Lord's Day? Since we are together then, how much more should we reflect on how we ought to edify the body from the gifts has given to each of us. As I reflect on Romans 12, 3 through 9, in sound thinking, emptied from any haughtiness or conceit, but in full humility, knowing God has given each of us a measure of faith. For just as we are many members in one body, all members do not have the same function. So though we are many members, we are one body in Christ. Each of us, by grace, is given a gift to glorify our Heavenly Father's name while serving in the body. We are to do this at all times, but especially on the Lord's day. So, whether it is through music Joyful noises, joyful praises or noises, running audio or media, hospitality and service, teaching or exhortation, generosity and giving or leadership with diligence, cheerfulness shown through mercy, a kind greeting or even a hug. Each of us, by the grace of God given to us, have the opportunity to function and serve in the body of Christ. We do this by letting love be genuine, which means without hypocrisy, and by abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good. Put it simply, hate what God hates and love what God loves. What an incredible opportunity to praise God with our lives in the church Praise God for that. As we continue to verse 4, For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. What are the works of God? 
Listen to the beautiful little voices in this building. Look at the fellowship we have with one another from different paths of lives. Yet we serve each other in love devoted to God. By His image in us, we are the work of God. I see in Psalms 139, 13-16, Beloved, our sovereign God wove us in our mother's womb. He formed our inward parts. Indeed, we should give thanks to God. For it is He who fearfully and wonderfully made us Imago Dei, which means that we have been made in the image of God, for His eyes have seen our unshaped substance. In His book, all the days were written, which formed us before those days came to pass. Our whole life, every day has been written in His book already. This is how intimately acquainted God is with His creation, the work of His hands. How intimately is God acquainted with His creation? Not a sparrow falls to the ground outside of the Father's will. So, in the same way, He numbered the very hairs upon our head. Thus, we ought to not fear, for certainly we are more valuable than sparrows. Paul drives this home, how acquainted he is with us as his special creation in Ephesians 1. When he states that he knew us before the foundations of the world in love. We see the triune God carrying out this work. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in every spiritual blessing, not a particular spiritual blessing, but rather every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So then, how can we find these blessings? Where must they be? They are to be found in Christ. Simply, it is in Christ and in Christ alone where we find our spiritual blessings. Does this just make you want to sing how great thou art? <laughs> For he, chosen, he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundations of the world. And in him, in Christ, we will be kept holy and blameless before the Father in love until the great and beautiful day when we meet our Savior face to face. We continue on to verse 11. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The psalm rejoices in God's faithfulness, finding peace from being delivered from his enemies by the sovereignty of God. We too can find peace in our God's faithfulness to deliver us from spiritual and natural enemies. Sin, death, hell, and the grave have been defeated. And so we need not fear when in our natural lives we are slandered or persecuted. As I see in Acts 4.23-31, 4, 4, 4, sorry. It's a great reminder and speaks profoundly to God's blessed decree upon the destruction of the wicked by the atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, it's quite beautiful that the title of this section in Acts 4, 23-31 is The Believer's Prayer for Boldness. From the word it states, When they were released... They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouths of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand had planned, predestined to take place. And now, look, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, they placed in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This boldness we also have by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, who testifies about the Lord's greatness. With confidence, we can also be ready to give an answer for the hope we have in Jesus Christ, returning every evil action against us with love, knowing God carries out His justice. All His enemies will be defeated. As Moses addressed the ears of all the assembly of Israel, thus saith the Lord in Deuteronomy 32, 35 through 40, vengeance is mine and retribution in due time. Their foot will stumble for the day of their destruction is near and the impending things has hastened upon them for the Lord will render justice to his people. And will have compassion on his slaves. When he sees that their strength is gone. And there is none remaining. Bond or free. And he will say. Where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. Who ate the fat of their sacrifices. And drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now that I am he, and there is no God beside me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Indeed, I lift up my hand to the heaven. And I say, as I live forever. So then, as the psalm rejoices through the sovereign work of God, so shall we. For Christ is the stone the builders rejected. He has become the chief cornerstone. This came from the Lord. This is marvelous in our eyes. Those who fall on this stone will be broken in the pieces. Give praise to the Lord, for He is mighty indeed. We continue on to verse 12. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Here we see a contrast between the righteous and the wicked. The wicked see their destruction and their plans continuously fail. Their evil plans by the sovereignty of God are turned to work for the good of God's people and His kingdom. The wicked are like fragile grass, whereas the righteous flourish like the trees planted by the water, so that the root grows so strong and deep. The divine grower ensures the righteousness are strong, vital, and productive. Psalms 1-3 one, Psalms one, I reflect on the divine grower plants them by the waters. By his mercy, they yield fruit in season. The righteous persevere and do not wither. By his grace, 
all they do prosper. Again, we see in John 15, 1 through 11, now by the will of God, Christ is our true vine. As God is the divine grower, we are the branches in an organic union with the vine, completely dependent on the life that flows from the trunk. The Father cuts away the bad fruit, pruning the good fruit to bear more. Jesus tells us by his word, we are clean. Abide in him. He will abide in you. No one can bear fruit unless they abide in the vine. He is the vine. We are the branches. We can do nothing apart from him. For the Father is glorified by this in which we bear much fruit, proving to be Christ's disciples. Christ states, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. There is joy in being connected with the vine, having his life flow through us and produce fruit for his glory. We continue on to verse 13. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. Notice, in order for the righteous to flourish, they must be planted in the house of the Lord. Abundant life and safety, as well as nurturing care, are found there. The righteous flourish in vitality, not by their own works, but by the sovereign works of God. As we abide in his courts, as Psalms 104, 104 reminds us, from our hearts thanksgiving should flourish, and praises resound in his courts. Bless his name, the Lord is good. Richard Sibbs in Breathing After God states, it is the presence of the king that makes the court. And it is the presence of God in his church that makes it so glorious and so excellent as it is. As I read that, I reflect on 2 Corinthians 6.16 6, as it states, We are the sanctuaries for the living God, in which he says, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Again, we continue to verse 14. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. Oh, how the saints persevere through the age. As Pastor Mike commented, on Daniel's age, in the midst of his persecution, he was not a young man, whether he was old in age, yet bold in God's wisdom and spirit. Pastor Mike reminds us, as long as you have breath in your lungs, God is not done with you yet. Beloved, how beautiful is it when the young see the face of the older and wiser saints around them? full of God's grace and mercy and being examples in their everyday lives. We ought to praise God for both the young and the old. We need the youth and the zeal of the young, but we also are abundantly blessed by the wisdom and faithful steadfastness of the elderly who have been down the road a little further than us, encouraging us to make the journey that it is worth it, that God is worth it, reminding us through every season that if we have Jesus, we have everything we need. What a blessed assurance we have witnessing the full life of the saints, giving praise to our Lord and sovereign Jesus Christ. After all, 
Proverbs 16, 31. Gray hair is a crown of beauty. It is found in the way of the righteous. I continue in Isaiah 46, 4. Thus saith of the Lord, even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it. And I will carry you. And I will bear you. And I will rescue you. So, then with encouragement, stand strong in the body of Christ. Lead the young as examples of how to run the race with boldness. Till that glorious day upon which I pray we all hear the blessed words we find in Matthew 25, 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things, but I will put in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. As we get to the end, verse 10, verse 15, to declare the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteous in him. Finally, we get to the end of the psalm and together with the psalmist, we are called to reflect upon the hope built upon Jesus. Jesus' blood and righteousness. To rejoice in the unchanging, enduring love of God. He is eternal and unchangeable in all His glory. We proclaim the same revelation given to Peter by God the Father in Matthew 16, 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This revelation is the rock the church is built on. And hell will not prevail. Our God is holy, righteous, and mighty to save. Beloved, Jesus is not a weak beggar knocking at the door waiting for anyone to open. No, He is a powerful Savior. There will be a day in which every knee will bow of those who are in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and then that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We must remind ourselves, as Romans 9.16 says, it does not depend on the one who wills or the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. To close, Pastor Mike posed the question to all of us, at the end of his sermon the other week, how will the church 500 years from now remember us? As we were all talking after service, my goofy self commented on sharing the gospel through memes. Yet, by the grace of God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, from time to time I do yield, and my mind does ponder slightly deeper things. My only logical conclusion to that answer, as simply as it may be, is that I will proclaim the gospel of the living Christ until I go to the grave. Whether from the pulpit, I am blessed to do so today, or at my workplace, or in the streets, or simply to my wife and my children, and their children, and to their children. Tell everyone that Jesus Christ lives, just as the apostles proclaimed, and the apostolic fathers, and the great martyrs of times past. In the same way the church has stood through all the ages, stood in perseverance, proclaiming the same message, Christ, He lives, Christ, He lives. So by the grace of the triune God, may also our children and their children and their children up to 500 years and beyond proclaim with one voice as they have learned from us, Christ, He lives. May the body of Christ be consistent in proclaiming Christ. He lives. For it is He who bears witness to these things. In, in Revelation 22.20, Jesus says, Yes, I am coming quickly. 
Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord be with us all. Amen.